Uh, he is Managing Director and Global Head of Catastrophic Risk Research at Guy, Compent uh, Guy Carpenter Insurance Reinsurance. An international expert on risk research, Guillermo puts mathematics and analytics in place to evaluate climate risks to cities, homes, and infrastructure. Guillermo appeared at the 2023 CAC Florida uh, Climate Champ, uh, Conference. And when he landed in Tampa, he asked Bob, where's the party? <laughs> <laughs> After the conference, a large number of CAC members descended on the video arcade on St. Armand's Circle, where Guillermo's expectations were met for a vigorous late night competitive and well-watered event, fiesta. Bienvenido. Guillermo, he will now present climate events and their impact on the insurance industry. All right, great. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. And it's a, it's a great privilege to be here with you guys. It's a great privilege to have known Bob now for a couple of years. And, uh, and I was sitting there and, and I was already restless uh, because I feel so inspired by the, the chats, uh, but also by your questions. I think this is an amazing community and group of people committed, interested, and with a lot of potential to do great things, right? To solve some of these problems. So I, I wanted to uh, talk about another dimension uh, that adds to this problem, which is uh, the financial dimension. And uh, as you know, here, uh, specifically in Florida, um, insurance is a, is a hot topic. It's a much debated topic. It's a critical topic. And um, I wanted to, I, I talked to Bob about uh, presenting to you some thoughts about new mechanisms that we are thinking of in the insurance industry that can contribute to helping the financial protection of our property, right? Uh, not only our houses and you know the things that, that, that we have, but also protect us from expenses uh, that are derived from evacuations. For example, the hotel bill, right? If somebody wants to spend a few days there after, after a watch or, or an evacuation warning has been issued. So the, 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 the genesis of this work actually uh, started in a, in a different context. Uh, you know, I, I was, 20 years ago, I was at the university, I was at Columbia University doing research, and we were doing research uh, on how developing countries are affected by catastrophes, right? And we, we know that a catastrophe, look at the earthquake in Haiti, for example, it can uh, cause such an impact to uh, an economy that is not resilient enough to sustain that impact, that it can throw that economy into a path of decay for a long period of time. And the country takes a very long time to recover, if at all, from that impact. So we know that, the data shows that. What we never thought was that the US would be in a, in a situation that kind of resembles uh, that, that, uh, that, that context. Um, I read this book 20 years ago, The Poor and Their Money, and um, it was really interesting. I love it. It's, a, it's about how communities in, in uh, places that, are, uh, that have no access to financial systems, to financial products, how they replicate the financial systems that we enjoy here in the developed world, but by community uh, organization. And I thought it was very, very inspiring to see how they come up with, with these systems at a community level. And two or three years ago, I, I have a very good friend at the US Geological Survey. His name is David, David Wald. He manages the, the response for earthquakes, right? All of these warnings and all of this stuff that we see for hurricanes, the USGS does similar work for earthquakes. They do a response mechanism after there's an event and David manages that. And uh, I worked with him for, for many years. And, uh, you know, over the last two, three years, we've been sharing information about what he sees uh, in the insurance world, both as a resident of Colorado, seeing how his insurance is changing, but also following the topic, right? And, uh, and a couple of years ago, I told him, David, I mean, it looks uh, with the insurance uh, retreat that we're seeing, and we will see why, why that happens, 
uh, it, it seems like we're gonna be in a potential situation where people here are gonna start losing access to financial products that we consider you know, a given. Uh, what does this mean? It means that your deductibles increase. It means that uh, your property is no longer insured, that they decline to renew your policy, that the insurer goes out of business or they leave the state. And amazingly, this has been happening in the last couple of years in many parts of the United States. In, in my opinion, it's a, it's a bit of a, of a warning sign that something is amiss because we haven't seen such a spread out uh, retreat in so many places in the U.S. at the same time. Uh, so I told him, I said, look, maybe we should look into these systems that people use in developing contexts to see if we could organize uh, the communities here in the U.S. to also replicate some of these financial systems when the formal financial products suddenly disappear from our midst. So this is a talk about that. And also it's a bit of an experiment because I, and you are the experiment, because I told Bob, um, you know, these concepts are, are, are a bit strange. Uh, they're not new, uh, they've been around, uh, but they haven't been used and talked about much. Uh, so I would love to hear your comments and, and your thoughts. Before we jump into the, the nitty gritty, uh, let me give you a very um, quick explanation of how the reinsurance and the insurance world works, right? So we, in this diagram, it shows it's a very simplistic, if you will, uh, representation of the insurance market. We are on the left-hand side of this slide. So we are either individual policyholders, we buy policies from the market, or we are a business and we buy a, a corporate policy that protects our business. And we buy it from an insurer, but oftentimes we don't buy it from the insurer directly. We buy it through an insurance broker, right? And this insurance broker uh, has the, the, the duty to inform us of what products are suitable for our needs and what is the best price and what are the, the pros and cons of each product. And they advise us. Uh, but ultimately, the risk is taken by an insurance company. This insurance company, of course, is underwriting a lot of policies. So sometimes they accumulate so much risk that they also need to buy a policy for themselves to protect themselves. This is what we call reinsurance. And this is a global market. And the purpose of all of this chain that you see here is to diversify risk. The concept, the basic concept is the basic concept of pooling. We cannot take the risk ourselves, right, to protect our house. It's just too, too big an impact. But the more we spread it out, the more we can be resilient to these events. So the reinsurance industry takes these risks from insurance, uh, and oftentimes they do it through a reinsurance broker. Like the company I work for, Guy Carpenter, is a reinsurance broker. So we help insurers and governments uh, distribute and diversify their risks. The reinsurer also at some point takes too much risk. For example, a reinsurer may have too much risk in Japan for earthquakes. They may want to swap that risk that they have in Japan for earthquakes for Florida hurricane, for example, or Thailand flood, or earthquake in another part of the, of the world. And that is called the retrocession market. So these are reinsurance companies that swap or buy reinsurance from one another. And then of course, there's also a, a, a branch of this market that has gone more into the capital markets, into the stock market, if you will, investor market. And that is through cat bonds. These are financial instruments that can be bought by investors. And investors, uh, through these cat bonds, they get an avenue to deploy their capital to work as if they were an insurance company without actually having to set up an insurance company. So it brings more capital into the market. All right. The point of all of this, and we don't have to you know, grasp all the details, is that there's a lot of interconnections. Uh, when we see is that our insurer is doing something, it may be very dramatic from our perspective, but it may be driven by factors that are coming from all of this cycle, right? We're going to see a couple of those. So um, I call them insurance pressures. These are, these are things that, uh, you know, have been publicly reported. Uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea of, you know, from, from the side of the insurers and reinsurance, what are the signals that the industry is getting that maybe help us explain what we are seeing in the retail market, right? In the policies that we buy. 
Well, first of all, and you've seen it in the chats this morning uh, from Rick and Bob, uh, the risks are increasing. We love to live on the coast and uh, the exposure is growing. We're building more and more and more. But these areas where we like to live are becoming riskier. I mean, this is just demonstrated by, by science. The insurance industry has the most powerful models to uh, estimate the potential losses from earthquakes, from hurricanes. The industry spends an enormous amount of money in building and sustaining these models. So they have access to all of this information. So they, they know. Of course, if you know, if you are the insurer and you know that your risk is increasing, you're going to take some measures to control that risk. Second, we've been in, a, in an environment of high interest rates. What does that mean? How does that affect insurance? Well, in two ways. Uh, first of all, remember that the insurance policy that you buy is a promise to rebuild uh, your property uh, to the state that it was before you had that impact. Uh, but if in the interim, interest rates are high, it means that the money that the insurance company has to pay to restore your asset grows over time. Right? Their expected loss to help you recover to the point where you were before is increasing rapidly because interest rates, construction materials are increasing in price very rapidly. So they need to catch up with that, with that inflation. But also uh, remember that insurance is a business in which people invest. And if interest rates are high, investors suddenly get different options that give them similar yields, similar profits without the risk that an insurance business carries. So now they have a choice. This means that capacity in the insurance business decreases. Money flows out of that insurance chain and goes into other investments, right? And that also makes the policies increase in price because now we have less supply. Uh, other things like war, supply chain, the pandemic, all of these things are affecting, of course, uh, the, the industry just as they're affecting all, all the economies. Then there's another factor called social inflation, which is a bit more obscure, but this uh, Florida is the, 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 the case example of, of, this, of this effect. Uh, in Florida, there, is, um, there, there was, uh, now it has been changed, but there was a law that was called assignment of benefits that meant that you as a policyholder, when you have a damage, uh, you can actually pass the rights to your contractor to claim the policy money for you. And this was meant as a service to the policyholder. The philosophy was fantastic, right? It, it means that the pressure on you is reduced and the contractor can deal with all of this stuff. However, it was abused in, in, in Florida, right? The contractors came to your house maybe and they said, oh, you know, we can replace your roof completely when maybe you had just partial damage. And you know, you, somebody comes to you and gives you that offer, it's very tempting to say yes, so you do that. And then these companies have an army of lawyers that then sue the insurer for as much, as much money as they can. What, what was happening? Well, the insurers, suddenly the, the, the payouts that they were giving, the, the, the claims that they were paying, exceeded all estimations that they had had because the pressure on the legal process was so enormous. Not only that, but uh, the law said that if the claimant uh, loses the trial, uh, the insurer still has to pay for all the costs of the trial. So it was a very asymmetric scenario in which the insurer lost no matter what. And that meant, you know, from a policy perspective, from a policyholder perspective, uh, you know, the, the, the offer to get a new roof might be tempting, but at the end of the day, that cost comes back to us, right? Because insurers say, well, I had all these losses from all these lawsuits. I have to increase premiums in order to make up for all those losses. So that also makes premiums increase. The laws have changed in, in the last couple of years. So we'll see how the new laws uh, affect, affect all of this. And then finally, uh, you know that we have a commissioner of insurance in each state in the United States, and uh, these uh, commissioners of insurance uh, set some regulations on pricing, right? They want to make sure that insurers are not uh, charging too much. So they, are, they, they, they often have caps on the amount of uh, premium that insurers can charge. And insurers, Remember, point number one, they're seeing risks increase and they have these models, right? And they have come into conflict with these caps. Basically, the models are saying the risk is here and the cap is there. 
and they have been pushing the commissioners to increase the caps to keep up with the risk. But the commissioners oftentimes, to protect the consumer, resist this movement. And then suddenly, insurance companies don't have any other recourse than to abandon the business. This is what we've seen in California. In California, there's been a couple of companies who decided to leave the state and stop writing uh, homeowners insurance. This is uh, big companies in the US. This is quite dramatic to the point that the commissioner of insurance in California has now is now in, in talks with the, with the insurance industry to basically adopt models that allow them to increase these caps and catch up with the risk. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see where that goes. But I wanted to show you that all of these factors are affecting uh, why our premiums are, are changing. All right. Uh, all of these things that I mentioned are in the public press. So you can, you can find in all of these references are here if you're interested. Uh, all of these articles and, and, and reports talk about all these issues that I, that I mentioned. Uh, but you know, let me let me just highlight one. Uh, there was an article in the Economist uh, titled "Uninsurable America." I, I recommend that you take a look because it describes very well, you know, everything I I, I said uh, in the introduction. All right, let me change a bit the story and uh, talk about um, the the eighteen hundreds. Um, it was actually last year here, uh, before I talk about the 1800s, let me talk about last year briefly. I was here at the, at the annual event with Bob and, uh, and you guys, I'm sure some, some of you were here. And, uh, and, and, you know, somebody, I was talking about parametric insurance, which I'm going to talk about also a little bit later. And I was uh, saying how this mechanism allows many parties, many investors to participate in the insurance uh, industry. And somebody in the audience, uh, uh, maybe the gentleman is here, said, oh, can, can, can people, can I, as a, as, a, as a citizen, participate, put my money to work in insurance and, you know, make money from it? And, and, and I responded, I said, it is feasible to do that. Uh, but since then, we've been working on all these mechanisms that I will discuss today that allow each of us to participate in the insurance industry more actively. And we'll see why that could be interesting. 1800s, New York City. Uh, all these companies, these industries uh, were experiencing a situation similar to what we are experiencing today. They were being charged increasing premiums uh, to run their businesses by insurers. And they were uh, discussing among themselves. And they were saying, these insurers don't know our business very well. They don't know our operations. They are estimating some premiums, but they don't know our risks very well. And they might be charging us more than we need to pay. We know where we are. We know our business and we have cash piles in our, in our businesses. Why don't we insure one another? And this was uh, quite a radical idea, right? That these companies could band together and decide to insure one another. If one had a loss, the others would help uh, this uh, claim, claimant recover and vice versa, right? So this gave rise to what is now called a reciprocal exchange. And this is a very interesting mechanism that allows companies and uh, citizens to exchange insurance policies while also benefiting from this business. It means that all of us become insurers and all of us become policyholders. So we are uh, creating our own business and we're benefiting from it directly. It gives the participants much more control over what you buy and over the products that, uh, that you need and you can access. And it isolates you from the disappearance of these formal products. It makes you resilient to the industry suddenly saying, I'm not going to write your house anymore. I'm not going, I see the level, the sea level rise, like you saw in the pictures from Rick. And uh, by the way, that, that would not be insurable. A sea level rise is not insurable because it is not a volatility issue. It's a new mean, it's a new normal. And the insurance industry does not insure normals. It insures spikes, right? So sea level rise is not gonna be insurable. But the fact that we uh, could build our own products gives us enormous control. How, do, how would this work? It works like, like this, but I'm going to skip this slide quickly. Uh, again, this is all explained in detail in this paper that I, that I cited that we're going to present at the World Conference on Earthquake Engineering this summer. 
uh, and I will pass it to Bob so that uh, he can share it if, if, if you guys are interested. Uh, but I'm going to explain to you the pieces of this diagram in a little bit more detail. Let's see if we have time. Let me uh, follow this example of uh, uh, an imaginary subscriber, an imaginary participant in this, in this, uh, in this new business. And let's suppose that Jane needs $10,000 in insurance coverage, the limit, right? And let's suppose that the insurance market charges 25% of her limit as annual premium. This, this number it may seem uh, exorbitant, uh, but just bear in mind that we've sold uh, reinsurance contracts last year for wildfire in California that exceeded these prices. So this is a quarter of your limit, you're paying it in premium, right? In four years, the company could just save this money and recover their limit, right? So these are these are the numbers that, these are realistic numbers. They're, they're on the you know far side of the distribution, but they are still and market realistic prices. Okay, well, if Jane bought a normal insurance policy, the policy that we buy typically, this is how it works, right? In year one, she pays her premium, 2,500 bucks, and she gets coverage for that premium. Year two, assuming that the premiums do not increase, then she repeats and repeats and repeats, and assuming that prices are constant, which they probably will not be, uh, then uh, this is how, how the progression works. How would it work with the reciprocal exchange? Well, it would be a bit different. In, in year one, remember, you're, you're building, and this is a one person, right? This is a one person creating their own insurance company. Uh, so Jane, the first year, doesn't have any pot of money to insure herself, right? So she pays the premium to an insurer, let's say, and she gets the coverage. It's, it's the same as before, right? She's still buying a policy from the market. But this year, she saves 250 bucks, you know, a 10% of that premium, as an example, and she puts it in a, in a pot. And let's put that, I put the same symbol as an insurance company because, you know, it's a little insurance uh, operation, let's say. Let's suppose that somebody is helping her manage all these flows of money back and forth. So she has to pay a cost. This system, maintaining the system, also has some operational costs. Let's say that that's, uh, you know, 1% of her premium, $25. All right, good. So now what happens uh, at the end of the day in year one? Well, in year one, she's actually paid more money than if she bought uh, a normal insurance policy, right? Because she had to save that money and she had to pay some costs. So in the end, she's, she's paying more. Uh, why is this good? Well, because in year two, now things have changed a little bit. Remember, now Jane has her own insurance company and this insurance company has 250 bucks now, right? So now she's paying a part of her premium to her own insurance company. She still gets the policy from the market because she needs that coverage, but she has reduced the limit that she asks the market to cover her for. And therefore she has reduced the premium that she pays. So now she's paying a little bit of premium to her own insurance company. But remember, uh, this is her own insurance company. So that premium flows back to her, maybe in the form of a dividend or in the form of a premium reduction, right? So at the end of the day, what has Jane paid? Well, Jane has paid 27, 12 bucks, a little bit less than year one, still more than she would pay in the normal market. If you continue this process, if Jane continues to save that little extra, and by year four, sorry, here, she's paid just about the same amount of money that she would have paid a normal insurance company, right? For a normal policy. So bear in mind that remember, because the prices are so high in this example, 25% rate online, 25% premium, it's a very, it's a it's a relatively high price. In only four or five years, Jane can now reduce the pro the premium that she's paying because she's building her own insurance company. And also we're assuming that there's no losses, that Jane hasn't had an event, right? So if we continue that, if we extrapolate that and we continue doing that numerical exercise, you see this, you see the line that is horizontal here. Uh, let me see if I can point at it. This line, this horizontal line is what she would pay every year, assuming that prices do not go up in the market, right? This is the normal premium that she would get from a normal policy. But this line that goes down, this is her actual expenditure if she participates in her reciprocal exchange, if she saves money to cover herself. Of course, again, assuming 
she's had no losses. There's been no events, right? We know that that's not realistic. There will be events. So what happens? Um, what is happening to, to Jane's progression? We call it, it's a progression towards self-insurance, right? And one of the references that I showed before of articles that I, that I mentioned explain some of these topics. There was one, it was an article written for the Washington Post that said people will have to save more money to protect themselves from catastrophes. You can save, and that's a good mechanism, but you can do something like this, and that's a better mechanism because you're actually using the pot of money that you are saving to participate in the business of insurance at the same prices that the market is charging, right? We're assuming here that the prices that you pay to external markets or internal markets are the same in percentage terms. Um, so what is, what is happening in this progression? Well, at the beginning, uh, all this big chunk of the pie chart on the left is being paid to an external insurer. And there are some costs, right? That we said, well, there's, there's a little cost of maintaining the system and also, there is a capital contribution towards pool, right? This is often called the surplus contribution, right? You're, you're, you're building the surplus of your insurance company. As, as time goes by, and assuming things go well, you progress towards the desirable state of, of the right here. You are now paying all your premium to your own insurance company, right? So you are benefiting from this business that is reducing your premium more and more and more. At that point, there are many ways to, to, to continue from that point. You know, people can take their contribution back, their investment back, that's a possibility, or they can keep contributing and the company can continue to expand. There's many, many possibilities, but you can see that the state of affairs here on the right is very different than the state of affairs on their left. In particular, what I think is more exciting, of course, it's more exciting to pay less, but it is also more exciting that you control the product. The, the reciprocal exchange has authority over what product it releases. So you're not uh, susceptible to some external company saying, we're not going to insure you anymore, right? The, the, the product is in your control. Now, what would happen in a real, uh, in a more realistic scenario? The numbers that you see here, by the way, this is all for, I calculated all of this for earthquake. Uh, this is for an example of a policyholder in San Francisco. Um, you can imagine that we can do the same for Hurricane. As a matter of fact, I'll show you some examples for Hurricane later. And what we did here is we ran a stochastic model, a probabilistic model that says that some earthquakes are possible and some earthquakes are going to cause damage to the property of Jane and therefore she's going to have a loss. Now, what's happening in this diagram? Well, uh, Jane saved money. She started building her reinsurance company. Uh, she broke even. She started saving money, uh, but then uh, she had some losses, small losses, and that delays her journey, right? She has some loss, so she has to rebuild this pot of money. But then uh, in year 19 of this simulation, she had a big loss. And there was a big earthquake, and she lost all the pot of money that she had saved. So she had to start over from scratch, right? The curve starts again. Uh, so this is, this is a possibility, right? We are putting our money at risk, so we can, we can lose it. But... Just to, just to also put this into context a little bit, because when we talk about pricing, sometimes we forget about, you know, what, what, uh, how are these caps that I mentioned before? How are they working, right? What are people really paying? Well, this was, uh, this is, there's a website in California, the California Arctic Authority, uh, sells insurance policies for earthquake. And this, I, I just did this a couple of days ago. And I, I said, well, uh, let's suppose that we try to buy a homeowner's policy in San Francisco for earthquake for this zip code, and uh, I don't remember what I put as a, as a limit, but let's, I think I put a million dollars as a limit. And basically it says that uh, at the end of the day, the, the CEA would charge you about $300, right? To 50 or $300, depending on the options that you select. That's about 0.4% uh, of, of, of your limit, right? Remember before this number was 25%. What the CEA is charging for earthquake in California today is 0.4%. It's very low. But what are, what are insurers being charged by reinsurers? You know, remember that they have to pass their risks on and on. Well, these prices that you see here are realistic prices from the market for all these different places, right? Uh, for San Francisco, Los Angeles, eh? 
So the expected loss is here. This is the probability of the insurer losing money. And normally they charge more, right? Because they, they, they want to make money and they have costs as well. So the difference or the, or the ratio between the premium that they charge and what they expect to lose is called a multiple. So you see that they are charging you know, multiples of two to three are pretty uh, quite commonplace. So compare this premium of 4.4%, that is what the reinsurers could be charging uh, uh, an insurance company in California versus the 0.4% that the insurer is charging its policyholders. It's a factor of 10, right? So uh, sometimes, you know, also when we talk about prices and everything seems to be on the rise, uh, we need to remember that the prices that the insurers are paying to transfer the risks is, is quite, quite larger. But one interesting thing here is why, why can the CA charge 0.4% if they're being charged 4%, right? Well, this is because they're doing pooling. They're managing an insurance company, right? And they have accrued money through state intervention or through uh, aggregation of premiums to be able to lower the price here. They are doing basically what I told you the reciprocal exchange can do for a community, right? They, we're replicating the way in which an insurance company works. Now, if instead of one participant, we have a community of participants, then what happens to the numbers? Well, uh, if you are the only participant in this, in this uh, reciprocal exchange, uh, you are subjected to a lot of volatility. Things can go great for you. You can be lucky, uh, but things can go, go horribly wrong for you, right? You can be unlucky. If you do the, uh, a bunch of simulations with a computer, you get uh, this type of behavior here in which, you know, in average, you'll do okay but uh, you could do great, right? You could have very little loss if you're lucky and there's no earthquakes, or you could do horribly if you happen to catch a bunch of earthquakes, right? But what happens if instead of one person participating, we now have a large community participating, a diversified community. We have people from different places participating. Well, what happens with the numbers is that then the volatility of the system gets reduced, right? And we have more confidence about the expected losses of the system. In that case, you see that the curves uh, bunch up a, a lot more on the right and the difference between being lucky or unlucky starts to disappear, right? You, uh, your expectation becomes pretty constant. That is the power of pooling, that we do it all together, right? Now, imagine the possibilities. By the way, uh, I, I caught this article in the insurance press recently. Uh, there's been demand to open 10 reciprocal exchanges in the last year. W what does that mean? It means that all of this uh, work that we are doing on imagining new insurance systems is catching the interest of people, right? And um, many times, well, we, we will see whether these 10 or more reciprocal exchanges that are being built will be successful. We, we'll see what happens. But the mechanism is accessible to communities. And this is what I find really exciting, that the cost of implementing a system like that is not large. It's not like opening a, a monstrous insurance company, right? The investment is smaller. And that's why I think it has a lot of potential. Um, but one, in order for, to, to make all of this work better, right? Uh, one problem that we would need to resolve if we were doing such an insurance company, insuring each other, is, well, how do we pay one another, right? How do we pay one another in a manner that uh, we trust the system, that is efficient, that we believe in it, that we're proud of it, right? And uh, here, this is one element that is new in, in all of this system, uh, is the usage of parametric insurance, which is a type of insurance that pays based on a measurement, right? So instead of uh, you calling the insurance company and saying, hey, I had damage on my roof, I want you guys to come and assess my claim. And you know, they'll, 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 they'll send someone whenever they can, because like you, there's been another 100,000 people with damages, so you, you have your place in the queue. And then they come, they assess the losses, but then the insurance company changes the assessment and they say, well, we're gonna pay you maybe 50% of that, or uh, all of that takes time, right? Instead of doing that, we do, we agree on something. We say, guys, if there is a hurricane that hits Sarasota with a category of three or larger, I'm gonna get 10,000 bucks or 20,000 bucks. And uh, that is a clear contract that we can 
calculate how fair it is, how we can calculate how much it helps to restore your, your assets. Uh, for businesses, for example, they could buy to protect their operations, to make sure that they remain in business while they maybe have to close their doors or maybe there's water on the floor. Uh, but the rules of the payout are very clear. Very clear to the point that we don't need insurance adjusters anymore. You don't need to hire an army of people to settle claims. In modern days, you know, people are experimenting with smart contracts, contracts that are automatable, right? That they detect when Noah says that the hurricane was a category three and automatically your money is, is put into your account, right? And it, it may be faster than you actually realize that you can query for, for a claim, right? So all of this is possible. Just to show you some examples, we do we build these policies routinely for large corporations and for governments. We just finished uh, a big transaction for Mexico. Mexico buys this type of insurance policy since 2006. They just got $200 million for Hurricane Otis that was described by Bob. Uh, and, uh, and they just renewed it this year. We designed their policy for earthquake. And, uh, and that money that they get, I think this year they're, they're buying 400 million in, in coverage, that money goes to emergency operations and immediate response. Of course, for 400 million is not gonna cover the cost of an earthquake in Mexico City, which will be in the order of many billions, but that money, uh, because it, it pays on a parametric basis, is transferred to the Mexican government in a matter of days, and they can use this cash to respond. So we can build this for earthquake. For example, here you see an example of a map. This is the policy that you would get, right? If there's an earthquake in any of those boxes and the magnitude of the earthquake is equal or higher than the number in the box, you get your money. You know, you basically your policy, instead of being 60 pages of legal mambo jumbo, uh, it's a map with uh, that tells you if the, if the earthquake falls here, this is where you're gonna get paid. It's a bit, it's a bit more intuitive and faster. For wildfire, we're using a system of satellites run by NASA that detects wildfires around the planet in real time. We actually have used this system to write insurance policies against wildfires. And we can tell the client almost in real time whether they're gonna get a claim or not. This is for Colombia, uh, an example that we did for them. And for hurricane, these are examples for Louisiana. I, I just came back from Louisiana last week. I was giving a chat about this stuff. And, uh, and here you see two hurricanes, Hurricane Ida 2021, another, another I, and uh, Hurricane Katrina, right, 2005. And you can see in the, this, on the maps, you see the hurricanes progress. This is real time information that we get from fantastic government organizations like NOAA, right? This is information that we get, it's high quality, it's fast. Well, we can do our modeling work a priori, so that when you see a hurricane coming, you can actually estimate and predict how much money is going to be lost in that impact. And that is what these curves uh, are trying to depict, right? The one in the middle uh, shows the maximum wind speed of the hurricane, these numbers that Rick and Bob were referring to, uh, that, that uh, is, determines the category of the hurricane, so we can track that. But then the bottom plot tells you how much loss is expected. Right? So if you can have access to that system through your reciprocal exchange insurance company that tells you if we have this kind of profile of wind speeds, you're going to have likely a damage of 10% in your house or in your community or 20% or 50%, then you can structure a policy that says if the, my damage expected goes above 25%, I want to get I want to start getting some money, right? So you can design how you want to get paid for these events completely from a scientific and modeling perspective in models that can be public that we well, that we can have trust in that maybe the CAC could advise on or build and in a transparent manner, right? So that you know where the money is going. You know how much percentage of your premium is going to cover your, your assets. You know how much is going to your surplus contribution. You know how much you're paying for the system to be there. And you know how you're getting paid. There's transparency in all components of the system. So uh, just to, to, to summarize, I think it's clear that 
um, you know, even though we, we debate many times, and you know, we, we love to complain, right, about prices going up and all this stuff, and it's real, and it hurts everyone, but there are pressures uh, that I hope I have, exp I have managed to explain as to why some of these things happen. It may not explain all of the, of the, of the phenomena that we're seeing in, in prices, but uh, I hope you, you get a, bit, uh, a slice of the picture, at least, of why uh, prices may increase. Uh, what is dramatic, in my opinion, is the potential disappearance of financial products. That, that, is, that is strange. It's strange that suddenly people in California cannot buy an insurance policy for earthquakes. I mean, it, it was bad uh, uh, for many years. I mean, insurance penetration in California for earthquake is in the order of 10 to 13 percent. So if there's an earthquake in California, 90 percent of people have no insurance whatsoever. And, 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 the, and the normal policy owner's policy does not cover them for earthquake. And FEMA is not obligated to pay them for earthquake, right? So 90% of California is vulnerable, the residents, uh, to, to earthquake. In the commercial space, it's different. It's about in the order of 30% or 40%. Um, there are saving mechanisms that we have looked at. And what I explained to you today is one of them, is how there, this reciprocal exchange. But what I would like you to reflect upon a little bit is to how much control such a system would give a community. Imagine that Sarasota, for example, uh, develops such a system, but then we go to Sausalito in California and we say, hey, you know, you guys need insurance for other events. Why don't we partner up? You participate in the exchange. We participate here. We come up with policies that are equiprobable, right? So we're paying a fair amount, both communities, and we try to help out one another. If there's an earthquake in California, the money that we all have accrued together will help pay them. If there's a hurricane here, the money that we have accrued together will help pay you. That is the kind of uh, exciting mechanism that I think could be on the horizon. Um, Finally, the, the efficiency and transparency of these systems. I think one of the frustrations that we have with our insurance purchase is that we don't understand it, right? You don't know how much risk you have. Of course, there's information out there, but it, it's a lot of work to, to, to find and, and digest and interpret all this information. It's not given to us in a way that we can comprehend it easily, right? But also when, when the insurance company says, well, we're not going to renew you this year. You, you're lost. You don't know why. You don't know. Nobody explains you anything. You don't have any numbers. It leaves you in a in a space of you know complete vulnerability. And um, I think it's time uh, for the communities, given all the pressures that, that that we're facing, to get more involved in the system. I don't know if the reciprocal exchange is the way, but there's going to be some time uh, that comes to us uh, for us to take action and get more involved in how we manage our economic protection in addition to mitigation, right? The mitigation is the first line of defense. We need to build better uh, to protect ourselves from all of these events. But financial protection is one of those dimensions as well. And we need to be more active and play a, a bigger role in how we design those systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guillermo. That was absolutely fascinating and a, a really lot to unpack, really uh, fascinating. I'm going to actually withhold my question because Guillermo did such a great job answering it uh, ahead of time in terms of the uh, innovative insurance uh, products that might be coming our way. Uh, does the audience have any questions for Guillermo? Okay, we have a couple. Okay, great. Would you go first, please? The, the idea of the reciprocal exchange to what we used to call a mutual insurance company. Yes, uh, it's a great question. And it's a very, very similar mechanism. Um, if, I, if I understand properly the two mechanisms, uh, in the mutual uh, case, um, the requirements are, are to build a company are stronger. Uh, basically, the reciprocal does not require that the reciprocal itself is a company, per se. It's just an agreement of subscribers to exchange policies. So I think the, the legal requirements are lower for a reciprocal exchange. But the mechanism is very, very similar. Uh, thank you. I thought this was very interesting. I, I think that my homeowner policy was converted by the uh, insurer Tower, I think was the name of the company, to a reciprocal. Uh, and I thought I understood it, but now I'm not so sure. 
Pete, I I under I followed your your remarks as far as the build up of the pool is concerned, but I lost you when you said you don't you don't have adjusters. Yes. Uh, how do you how do you pay out a loss? How do you know how much the homeowners law lo my loss is if I lose uh um, I lose my roof, for example? Right. Right. Great. 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 Well, first of all, uh, there are many companies out there that we know them as insurance companies, but uh, really in their mechanism, they're actually uh, under law, they're reciprocal exchanges. USAA, for example, is a reciprocal exchange, right? Their community is the veterans community. Uh, there's there's uh, farmers, I believe, is also a reciprocal exchange, right? Their, their, com their original community it was the farmers, right? So there are many companies that maybe we don't know their history, but they operate as reciprocal exchanges. It's just we've lost, you know, they're so big that you, you, you lose touch with what they really are. Um, so it's possible that your particular company at some point moved to the model of a reciprocal exchange and that's what they were communicating to you, right? Uh, now, the other question that you had about uh, adjustment. Uh, so there are two concepts that I that I presented here. One is the reciprocal exchange per se, and that is the mechanism of the insurance company. That insurance company can operate as a traditional insurance company, meaning uh, we can send adjusters right to your house to measure there. But uh, the efficiency of such a mechanism would be low. And this affects all current insurance companies. Of course, you still need that for some claims, right? If your house, if you had damages to a part of your roof or to something very specific, if you wanna cover your house, you need that kind of assessment, right? But if you wanna, if you wanna cover, for example, uh, expenses from evacuation or business expenses because you cannot operate your business for three months, then do you really need somebody to come to your business or your house and see that there is water on the floor. Could it be sufficient to look at a satellite picture and say, there's my house and it's all blue around. Isn't, isn't that not enough? Uh, and so the, 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 what I'm proposing is not that this reciprocal exchange completely substitutes traditional insurance. We still need traditional insurance. But if the traditional insurer is saying, we're gonna increase your deductible, so you, you, we put, we want you to bear a bigger part of the risk, or you need two million dollars in insurance, but we're only going to give you one. What do you do with those excess risks that you have? Well, a mechanism like this could help you get some cash in a moment of need through an efficient mechanism. Remember that because we don't send adjusters, we just look at a map. We can do this right after the event has happened. And you can have your money in your bank account the next day. That, that is a different type of product, right? But that product will be cheaper to operate. And it will be easier for a community to agree on. Why? Because we don't have to send people to Bob's house to see what was his damage, right? We just look at, at Noah, and Noah says that it was a Category 4 and Bob is in Sarasota, and he has a policy for Sarasota, so Bob gets a payout, no questions asked. Right? So it's a different type of mechanism for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. David, well, uh, one more question, because we're running kind of behind, and David? Okay, this could go long, so we'll just keep it Ooh. as brief as you need to. But I may have missed, just the explanation of how geography plays into the pooling. Yes. Because if we have a Cat 5 hurricane with a 16-foot storm surge, everybody is going to have a claim. Right. And so you have to have somebody who hasn't, isn't processing a claim to put the money into the, into the system, right? I mean, how, does that, how right. does that work? Yeah, this only works if we have communities in diversified geographies, right? I mean, you need, we could contemplate a reciprocal that operates on this basis for all of Florida, for example. You know, it's unlikely that all of Florida is gonna be affected by the same hurricane all at once, right? Even better, it's, it's more interesting if the community here partners with a community in Colorado. They're worried about wildfire. Or California, they're worried about earthquake or in Louisiana for flooding. That is the real power, right? 
the, the, the reason why this is interesting for the U.S. in particular is because the U.S. is a vast territory affected by a variety of risks, and the U.S. does not have a national insurance pool like many countries in around the world have. And come from Spain. In Spain, we have a pool. You see, in Spain, we don't have a lot of catastrophes like you guys do here. But if there's an earthquake in Spain, we have some earthquake country in the south, uh, people don't have to buy any earthquake insurance policy. It's covered by the government. How come? Is it because you know it's a it's a more socialistic government? Well, no, it's because People are building a pool nationally. When you buy your retail homeowner's policy in Spain, you pay a small tax because everybody buys it. This tax is very small. You know, it could be a, a three, $3. But that money is put into a pot. And that pot grows over time. Today, it contains about 8,000 million euro. That money has been sufficient over the last you know, three or four or five decades to pay for all the catastrophes we've had in the country. Of course, it empties, right, after a big storm or a big flood or a big earthquake, but then it replenishes again. The U.S. would be such a prime case to implement something like that. But, you know, the, the premise why we wrote this paper is because uh, the complexity of building a national pool uh, seems large. You know, a lot of states would have to agree to do this. And it's just the process seems complicated. And what we were thinking is, can we replicate this system using one of the greatest assets of the U.S. is citizen action. Can we replicate it ourselves? And it seems the legal framework allows us to do it. Great. Sounds like we can get some great lessons from uh, Europe. 